Hi everyone, a very good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to Gleneagles Hospital's 25th Annual Medical Seminar 2023. My, na my name is Paige and it's an honour to be your host for today. Thank you so much for taking your precious time to join us this afternoon. And the theme that we will be focusing on this year is Wellness Across Generations, Navigating Obesity and Active Aging. Today, we are really excited to have a lineup of seven speakers today who will be presenting on the related topics and as well as two moderators joining us. And they are Dr. Vivian Lim, endocrinologist practicing at Glenicals Hospitals, and Dr. Wong Siu Wei, medical oncologist at Park Wei Cancer Center. They will be leading the two panel discussions that will be happening later on. And for the first half of today's webinar, we will be focusing on the topic on obesity. And we're going to have four specialists who will be presenting on this topic and then followed by a panel discussion. For the second half of the webinar, we will then focus on the topic of active and healthy aging. Then we will have three specialists who will be touching on this topic and then followed by a panel discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, we do hope that you'll find today's seminar very, very informative and it's also definitely a good opportunity for you to foster meaningful relationships with our specialists from Glenagos Hospitals. Alright, so before we start, there is some useful information for me to share with you. So if you'd like to view the profile of today's presenter and the abstracts of their presentation, you may also scan the QR code on the screen right here. And alternatively, you may visit the event website at glenigles-seminar.com. That will be www.glenigles-seminar.com. Also, if you have any questions for the panel later on, you may submit them through the Q&A section in the Zoom and we will address them during the panel discussion. Thirdly, do engage us on social media and our handle will be at Glenigles Hospital. Alright ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us kickstart today's webinar and without further ado, let us welcome the CEO of Glenigos Hospital, Mr. Thomas B, for his welcome address. Thomas, please. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Glenigos Hospital's 25th Annual Medical Seminar. The theme for this year, Wellness Across Generation and Navigating Obesity and Active Aging, is opportune with the latest findings from the Ministry of Health's National Population Survey 2022 and Health Promotion Board's National Nutrition Survey 2022, released two weeks ago on the 27th of September. Obesity is on the rise in Singapore. The prevalence of obesity was 11.6% in 2021 to 2022, up from 10.5% in 2019 to 2020. Over three in five people, or 61% of the population, are exceeding their daily calorie intake in 2022, compared with 55% in 2019. The data is alarming to me, and it shows that we, as healthcare providers, have our work cut out for us. Singapore's population is rapidly aging, and is set to attain super-aged status in 2026, meaning we will have 21% of our population aged 65 and above. But we are also living longer Patients need you, doctors and healthcare professionals, to help them stay active, eat healthily, and live well as the years catch on. Today, we have curated a robust program with speakers from diverse backgrounds to share about tackling obesity and active and healthy aging. I thank our panel of speakers for the time and generous sharing of new treatment and new protocols to help us live better. Glen Eagles, is also a model of active aging too. We are fit, healthy, and 64 years old this year. We are staying current by continuously upgrading our infrastructure from sheltered walkways, facilities enhancement, and renovating our operating theatres, and bringing in new OT equipment to strengthen our capabilities and support your practice. Glen Eagles treasures this partnership with you, and we will support your practice to deliver good medical outcomes, and care for good for many more generations. Thank you for joining us today, and I wish you an engaging and fruitful afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Wee. And now, let us welcome Dr. Owen He, the CME Chairman for Glen Eagles Hospital, to make his opening speech. 
On behalf of the organizing committee of the 25th Glenigo's Hospital Annual Medical Seminar, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our friends and colleagues. Thank you for making time on a precious Saturday afternoon to be here with us. We are grateful for your support and presence. The past three years, we've been focused on fighting COVID. But with COVID on a bit of a back burner for now, it's a nice change to be able to explore other important issues in healthcare, such as obesity and ageing. Hence, our theme for today's seminar, Wellness Across Generations, Navigating Obesity and Active Ageing. This afternoon's programme will bring together a panel of speakers who will share on a wide range of issues relating to obesity and active ageing. Each panel session will also end with a Q&A session where the panellists will field questions that you may have for them on the topics discussed. We hope you will find the talks engaging, insightful, and may you gain new perspectives to benefit your patients for time to come. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right, before we commence today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen, let us engage in a poll question. And in the question is, in 2019, 55% of the population was reported to exceed their daily calorie intake. So what is the percentage of the population that has increased to in 2022? Yes, so in 2019, it's 55% of the population exceeded their daily calorie intake. So how about last year in 2022? What is the percentage? It's definitely increased by how many percent? So the options will be 58%. 61%, 65% 65 or 70%. So make your poll. Let's see how well you know the percentage. Okay, let's take some time for that. Most of you chose 65%. It's quite close to the answer, <laughs> to the correct answer actually. All right. So we do it invite everyone, we'd like to welcome everyone to join us in this poll question. Let's see, hmm, I think not, most of you didn't get the correct answer. <laughs> a little hint. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, the right answer is option two, 61%. Most of you are quite close and yes, 61% of the population are exceeding their daily calorie intake in 2022 compared to 55% in 2019. All right, no worries ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker for the day, Dr. Tan Chun Hai, General Surgeon, speaking on the topic of surgical management of obesity. Dr. Tan, please. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Chun Hai. Today, I'll be talking to you about surgical management of obesity and what are the options and what are the things that we consider before we offer you that. Um, I'm a consultant surgeon at Glenigo's Hospital. Uh, my clinic is Surgery Care, Bariatric and General Surgery. I'm also the president of the Obesity for Surgery Society in Singapore. This is my bariatric case mix disclosure, predominantly sleeves, some bypass, and now we're doing more revision surgery and some intragastric balloon insertions. Now the outline of my talk, today I'll be talking about, uh, introduce myself, I will talk about obesity and diabetes in Singapore, and what are the weight loss options, what are the indications, and what are some of the beneficial effects of bariatric and metabolic surgery. So a little bit about myself, graduated in University of Melbourne. I've been studying in Singapore since uh, Premier 1. Um, I went to stomach cancer advanced training with uh, Professor Kim in uh, Seoul National University. And then uh, another further training in metabolic surgery in uh, Taiwan with uh, Professor Wei Jie Li. I do general surgical work and these are some of my pictures. Now, obesity and diabetes in Singapore, we know that diabetes is a global emergency and we have a very, very steep rise in the incidence of diabetes coming up in the, we are located in the Western Pacific region. So you can see that from uh, 2015, we are going to increase from 150 million to 214 million uh, diabetes uh, incidence uh, over these few years. Now, diabetes around the world uh, estimated the top three countries in 2040 will be that in China, uh, India, and United States of America. Now, obesity rate is also increasing in Singapore. 
Now, one in nine will be diabetic with the increasing rate of obesity in Singapore. And by the age of 60, one in three will be diabetic. Now, one in 10 in Singaporeans are obese, obesity rate about 11%. Now, just as a background, USA and the Middle East were looking at 50 to 60 percent uh, obesity rate. China is uh, emerging uh, from 20 to 30 percent. Uh, in Southeast Asia, highest rate actually is in Thailand and Malaysia. Now, obesity rate in Singapore, according to age breakdown, uh, is also increasing, especially the young age group. Now, with the increase in obesity rate, you have a higher risk of a diabetes rate in Singapore as well. Now, what are the different types of treatment that we will offer to our patients? Number one, diet exercise. Number two, medications. Number three, endoscopic procedures. And then fourth is bariatric surgery. Now, for different um, weight class, we will offer different things. Uh, overweight and class one obesity. Now, Asian class 1 obesity, we're talking about BMI 27.5 to BMI 32.5. We will talk more about diet, exercise, medications, uh, intragastric balloons, maybe. Now, when you talk about class 2 obesity, Asian class 2 obesity, BMI 32.5 to 37.5, we'll be talking more about balloons, surgery, and then class 3 and beyond, more about surgery. Now, what are intragastric balloon? There are, I will classify into two types. One is the swallowable, one is the ellipse balloon. You, you, it will last for four months. It will self-deflate and you will pass out uh, the balloon. The other types of balloon, you need a scope to insert the balloon, the Obera 365 as well as the Spets 3. Spets 3 is uh, adjustable. So 12 months later, you will need to have another scope to remove the balloon. So this is one of my patients' experience. The nausea and vomiting is to be expected. It is the worst within the first week. And uh, you have the option of staying inpatient if you are very worried about the nausea and vomiting. Uh, you lose about 5 to 10% of your body weight within the first few weeks, and then you continue until the balloon is out. Okay? Uh, the support from a company is good. There's a multidisciplinary approach, so you need to see the dietitian. I believe Hui Mei is also on this session that she will be sharing later. Now, these are some of the contraindications, not exhaustive list. If you have previous surgery to the stomach, no go for balloons. Previous uh, adhesions and worrying uh, abdominal surgery, also no go. These are some of the risks I will explain to my patients um, during, the uh, during the consultation. Now let's talk about surgery. Surgery with the advent of laparoscopic uh, surgery. We are all now doing bariatric surgery, all done laparoscopically. Now gastric band, we are no longer doing this for the past few years. In fact, I've been taking out bands and converting them to sleeve or bypass. Um, so sleeve gastrectomy is still the majority of uh, procedures done in Singapore. As of the audit 2021, close to 70% of procedures are done uh, are sleeve gastrectomy. Now, rule and white gastric bypass is still the gold standard, the longest uh, and longest proven track record for long-term weight loss. Uh, more for diabetes, more for more for diabetes resolution. Uh, OAGB has uh, is now emerging to be a very key contender for severe diabetes, and uh, just been approved by ASMBS as one of the proven uh, bariatric procedures. Uh, BPD, biliary pancreatic diversion, we, we don't do that nowadays uh, with uh, high risk of nutritional deficiencies. Now let's look at the indications uh, for surgery. Uh, with the updated uh, IFSO and ASMBS uh, 2022 guidelines, it has dropped the BMI cutoff to 27.5. Uh, personally, I, I believe 27.5 is a bit low. Uh, the previous guidelines we used was 32.5. So I will stand somewhere in between, uh, BMI more than 30, um, for, for patients who really know and know what they want and really qualify for, for this procedure, uh, especially those with comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, high lipids, OSA, fatty liver, and all those things. 
Um, this is the DSS-2 uh, criteria for diabetes, recommended and highly recommended to go for surgery. Okay, Non-obese or Asians uh, less than 27.5 will be for non-surgical treatment. Now this is uh, beneficial outcomes for bariatric and metabolic surgery. You have your improvement in your type 2 diabetes, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular events high blood pressure, uh, OSA, fatty liver, GERD, and your joint disease. Now let's talk about DM control, improvement in your HbA1c. I never use, we never cure diabetes, we just bring them into remission and you improve their micro and macro vascular complications. Now this is a, a summary of uh, randomized control trials only for BMI less than and above BMI 35. Now we can compare the drop in HbA1c for surgery, which is the blue bar, and the best medical lifestyle treatment with diet, exercise, and medications with the red bar. So you can see that across all BMI, across all randomized control trials, surgery will have a much improved HbA1c change compared to best medical therapy. Now let's talk about all-cause mortality and a reduction in your cardiovascular risk. With surgery, you are less likely to die from all these all-cause mortality, less likely to have uh, adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, this is a study that shows uh, improvement in 29% of hazard ratio uh, after surgery at 16 years. I believe there is a more recent study by ASIM in NUH in which you have up to 49% risk reduction rate over a 30-year period. So I think that's the longest and the best uh, all-cause mortality improvement with bariatric and metabolic surgery that we have. Uh, outcomes will in resolution of uh, hypertension. This is a randomized control trial. Um, you can see that at 12 months, you have a 25% complete resolution in which your pre-op uh, hypertension uh, medications are completely dropped at 12 months. And uh, you have the other 75% in which you drop one or two antihypertensive medications compared to medical therapy, resolution rate of 12.8%. Resolution of NASH, you have an improvement in your NASH outcome for bariatric surgery, and this can be due to various, various factors. And this, uh, one of the papers I published uh, can be used, HSCRP as, can be used as one of the surrogate marker to predict long-term uh, resolution of uh, NASH. Now, resolution of OSA, um, up to 80 to 90 percent resolution of uh, sleep apnea with uh, BPD as the most successful. So related to weight loss, the more you lose, the higher your chance of your resolution of your OSA. This is a recent study by uh, published in JAMA. So decrease in cancer risk post surgery. So you have a 32 percent lower risk of developing cancer and a 48 percent lower risk of cancer-related death. Uh, after bariatric and metabolic surgery. So you also have uh, improvement in your psychosocial and psycho, uh, psychological improvements. Uh, I've got patients that improve uh, more confident in going out to the society, getting a job, getting into a relationship, getting married and having children. You have better moods, you have better self-esteem, you, you get employed in a job. And there's also improvement in your peak costs improvement in the fertility, and they are able to start a family after that. So I'll just summarize. Um, there are different weight loss options, diet, exercise, medications, uh, endoscopic procedures, as well as bariatric surgery. And according to each category of obesity, as well as what the patient wants, we will offer uh, different procedures. And uh, they all come with risk, and I'll discuss this with my patients at uh, the consultations. Uh, but some patients already come to me saying that, Doctor, I want a sleeve. Doctor, I want a balloon. Doctor, I want a bypass. So we will counsel them accordingly to, for, for each. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for your insightful sharing to start off today's medical seminar. Next, I would like to have the honour to invite Dr. Eric Koo, endocrinologist. His sharing is titled Obesity Management, Keep Calm and Take Steps, an endocrinologist perspective. Dr. Ku, please. A very good day to everyone and thank you for taking time to attend these sessions on very important subjects. 
I'm sure you've met many patients who have these conditions and I hope that after these series of sessions that you will get more answers and be able to answer your patients better and manage them better. If you had asked me about these, to give this talk um, in 2000, year 2000, we may have had serious problems. I may have not had in much to say because many of the therapeutics then were not available to help manage our patients well. But thankfully, over the last three years, this has changed. A new class of medications and further medications have been available such that we can really offer these to our patients to help them overcome their weight management. So unlike the right side of the picture where I, I may be banging my head, hopefully at the end of this session, we can avoid all these as well. Firstly, we need to talk about definitions. We need to, to define what um, obesity is. Uh, body mass index is not the most ideal, but is a good crude and start to measuring obesity. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the international standards and, and criteria for BMI. And in the middle, these are the Asian cutoffs. In particular, I just want to highlight the BMI of 23 to 27.9 indicates overweight. More than 28 indicates obesity, and there are degrees of obesity as well. If we do do waist, manage, waist measurements, these are, these are highlighted below as well on the slide. Firstly, when we talk to our patients, we really need to address these properly and ask um, for permission. Ask permission to discuss these problems because many patients may be uh, guarded they may already have been frustrated with healthcare professionals, their own journey already, and they may not want to talk about these issues, especially if they don't come to you talking, wanting to uh, look into weight management. We need to be neutral, we need to be non-judgmental, and as far as possible, explore the patient's readiness to change, and also the reasons why they want to make these changes as well. The next thing to do is to check for complications and secondary causes. Weight can cause and an impact a multi-system problem and therefore uh, you can highlight and see on this, on this uh, diagram that it affects all parts of the body. On the respiratory front, it causes obstructive sleep apnea. From the GI side, the liver, it causes fatty liver. Gynecological-wise, for the ladies with obesity, it can cause polycystic ovary syndromes, fertility issues, and for the men, hypogonadism as well. Mechanical-wise, it can cause osteoarthritis. And of course, we cannot forget the cardiovascular complications related to obesity in terms of uh, ischemic heart disease, stroke, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension as well. Not to forget the psychological issues and the psychiatric issues as well. Many of our patients with obesity suffer from anxiety and depression as well. In order to proceed, we need to then assess whether they have and are taking any weight-promoting medications. These include antipsychotic, anti-epileptic, uh, antidepressant tablets, which they may be withholding from you unless you explore deeper into these. If they do have diabetes, check the class of medications that they're on. Are they on sulfonylureas? These can cause weight gain. Are they taking insulin? And if they are taking this inappropriately, they may be, in effect, causing weight gain. We then need to look at other contributing factors. These include diet, their activities, explore any genetic causes or syndromic causes, such as um, early onset obesity, Ask and see what trials and um, therapies they've been trying on and see whether they've been taking any supplements as well. Other complications that may, they may be suffering from which affect their daily activities include the, any sleep disorders. Do they have any disordered eating habits? Other things to talk about and discuss are any environmental or socioeconomic factors. When we do any investigations, we may be looking in deeper... Um, when we're, we're doing laboratory examinations, we want to look at their metabolic parameters, look at their glycemic levels, their lipid management, liver function, thyroid function, 
sex hormones, especially for those who have polycystic ovary syndrome, endocrine testing to exclude acromegaly or Cushing's, and also check their urine for any renal disorders. Endoscopies may be ind indicated if they have any reflux disease, and if they do describe any sleep apnea, you may want to consider sleep studies as well. And of course, if you pick up anything where imaging is indicated, please, please proceed with those. When we talk about management, we, we need to individualize our approach. Each patient is different. We need to ask our patients what their goals and concerns are, what are the healthcare professional issues, and then how to address these. We may need to prioritize them if the list is very long. If we do pick up any underlying cause, we do need to think about addressing these, such as untreated hypothyroidism, for example. When we, took, when we go ahead with pharmacotherapy, we need to go back to basics and really establish that they have a good lifestyle habits. So that's looking into their diet, balancing it with their exercise, and then thinking about any behavioral modifications that might be required before we proceed on to pharmacotherapy, bariatric surgery. Just to highlight again, there are criteria for starting and initiating pharmacotherapy, and these are when the BMI is more than 30 with no comorbidities, or a BMI of 27 with one or more comorbidities. These include hypertension, dyslipidemia, or diabetes. It is once again important to remember that pharmacotherapy is an adjunct only and not, not to be used on its own without the lifestyle measures. Here are a list of medications that previously were used to, to manage weight. They include Olistat, Phentermine, and Bupirinone. The mode of actions are listed here and the side effects as well. Most of the side effects are GI related. For phentermine, it causes increase in heart rate, anxiety, um, and, and there are also some contraindications as well. There are some 4Gs that I want to talk about further. Most of these on this slide actually deal with individuals with diabetes and obesity. They include guanides, metformin, which has been on the market for a long time. Other weight loss measures, medications include SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor ag agonists, which are the ones that we are going to go into deeper, and then the newer, um, more, more upcoming medications include the glucose-dependent insulin nootropic polypeptide and GLP-1 receptor dual agonists, the fifth generation glyprons, the sixth generation triple agonists, Unfortunately for weight management, there are only two that are available at the moment. And on the right, these are liraglutide and semaglutide. The rest of the table are the other GLP-1 receptor products that are registered in Singapore and are used for management of diabetes, individuals with diabetes and obesity. How do these functions, how do these me medications work? Liraglutide and semaglutide are the GLP-1 in creatine mimetics. They actually help by stimulating postprandial insulin secretion. It causes slowing of the gut, so people feel less hungry and more full. It also affects the appetite to reduce appetite sensation and therefore reduce their appetite and cravings and thereby lose weight. Unfortunately, these then cause GI symptoms, including abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. However, these side effects can be mitigated. Co absolute contraindications include individuals who have a history of medullary thyroid cancer or MEN type 2 syndromes. For individuals who are taking semaglutide 2.4 mg subcut for obesity management, these are, this is marketed and branded as Wegovy. The, it's a dose at 2.4 milligrams. We can expect uh, 10 to 18 percent weight loss from baseline. Whereas for semaglutide 1 milligram for diabetes management, uh, the weight loss is not so pronounced. So, how do we mitigate the side effects? 
some of the things that I suggest to my patients are to start on a low dose, gradually increase it, warn the patients about these side effects so that they can expect them, but also tell them about what sort of weight loss uh, quantum they can expect. It needs to be used in conjunction with lifestyle, low caloric diets and resistance exercise. We also need to give them access to reviews and also early access where necessary. The goal really is to titrate to maximum effective and tolerable doses and to consider stopping if the, if the goals are not achieved or consider continuing if the long-term goals are achieved and there's persistent and sustained weight loss. Unfortunately, all good things need to come to an end or rather a, a, a break and halt. We need to think and uh, you consider any suicidal thoughts and self-harms. This has been highlighted by HSA's recent publication in their bulletin. This was highlighted earlier in the European and the UK uh, regulatory healthcare boards. They've noted uh, increased risk of suicidal uh, thoughts and ideations in patients on GLP-1 receptors, but however, have not confirmed that there's a direct link. So what do we do in practice to help reduce these problems? We need to adhere strictly to the treatment indications, discuss with and warn patients about the side effects and potential risk. With regards to the risk of psychiatric disturbances, it could be that in this population, there's already an increased risk because of their condition. Weight loss and treatment itself is associated with an increased risk of suicide. So whether it's a causal effect or a real observational issue, we do need to wait for more information. The next step is talking about um, meal planning and, and eating habits. Please stay tuned for this. Ms. Wong will go through this and it's very important. For physical activity, we need to warn our patients and encourage them to continue with their cardio aerobic exercises, but also continue with resistance training as well. We've noticed that with GLP-1 receptor agonists, the weight loss not only causes fat mass loss, but there's also skeletal muscle loss. So it's important that we actually encourage our patients to actually plan in some weight uh, training or resistance exercises so that they do not lose muscle mass as well. Surgical options, I hope you've been listening to Dr. Tan's earlier, earlier session, so I will not um, delve deeper into this. It's really exciting times for the endocrinologist when we manage and other specialists when we manage obesity and weight. The historical anti-obesity therapeutics didn't give much uh, weight loss. At the extreme was the, at the other end of the extreme was the surgical options which can bring up to 20 to 30% weight loss. But now with the newer generation obesity management therapies, we can see up to, up to a close of 20% weight loss, uh, which we previously would not be able to see. So obesity is a chronic condition. When you next see your patient with weight management issues, keep calm and take one step at a time. There's no one size that fits all. We do need to address these conditions as a multi-pronged approach. If there are any complications, secondary causes, let's try and deal with them as well uh, and then take one step at a time. Please stay tuned for the next session and then also uh, we'll be happy to take more questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Ku. I like that. Take your take one step at a time, right? Okay, up next, we will have Ms. Wong Hui Mei, Principal Dietitian, sharing on the topic of dietary approaches to shading weight, the real deal. Over to you, Ms. Wong. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, after listening to two doctors talking about the medical and surgical weight management, so now I'm going to talk about the dietary approach to shading weight and what is the real deal. So, I'm Hui Mei. I'm the principal dietitian in Glen Eagles Hospital. 
Okay. So this is a little bit introduction about myself. I'm a di clinical dietitian for more than 10 years and I actually my main interest and uh, expertise is actually in adult weight management, especially uh, bariatric surgery. So other kind of clinical diseases also actually I've been always seeing is like uh, diabetes, surgical weight man uh, surgical diet management, um, Meant, uh, women's health and also for the malnutrition. Yeah. So I went for my advanced training in uh, bariatric surgery and pediatrics in uh, Cleveland Clinics in 2015 under this uh, MOH HMD, uh, HMDP fellowships. Okay, so as shared by Dr. Tan just now, so the obesity rate in Singapore is actually in increasing trend. So not only obesity, but also for the overweight trend as well. Okay, so when does weight loss occur? Weight loss occurs is actually when there's an energy deficit created. When, uh, intake, when energy intake is less than energy output, there actually the uh, weight loss will actually come. Okay, so the, what is the diet therapy for weight loss? So based on Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, so a, di a diet that prescribed by a dietitian for weight loss patient, it must be actually individualized. So we look at patient's preference and health status. We make sure that the nutrient is adequate and at the same time, there's a caloric deficit. So we based on these few strategies, so 1,002 to 1,005 caloric for women and 1,005 to 1,008 for men. Or we actually create a deficit of 500 to 750 calorie per day based on their uh, base, baseline diet or any evidence-based diet that create deficits and caloric but at the same time restrict food types. Okay, so currently continuous energy restriction is actually the main form of restrictions from the diet manner. Yeah, so this continuous energy restriction is clinically proven that it is effective but however, it might be actually too rigid and difficult to maintain for some uh, people. So that's the reason why intermittent fasting has gained popularity in the last decade. So for this IF, right, it's actually popularized in 2012 by uh, BBC documentary Eat Fast, Live Longer. So thereafter, a few books actually came out talking about intermittent fasting, but of course, social media as well. So, but they are mainly based on personal stories and experience. Yeah, so for intermittent fasting, we know there are a few types of it. The most commonly we see is actually the twice a week uh, method, which is like five days eating normally and two days fasting and cap the calorie intake between 500 to 800 calories per day. So for alternate day fasting is basically similar. So there will be one day is actually like a fast diet or their intake is actually less than 25% of normal intake. So the one that we always been he uh, hearing is actually the time restricted uh, fasting, which is actually like uh, we have this 16-8 method or the 14-10 method. Why is it actually popular is because since most people are actually fast when they are sleeping, so they find it easy to, to, to manage. And the process can be repeated or it can be once or twice a week, depends on the personal uh, the preference. So the question now is that what is the effectiveness? Okay, so now we look into the study actually conducted in 2022. This is a meta-analysis uh, and the study aim is to systematically explore the effect of IF, various types of IF in humans. So this is the study design. So we can see that 43 RCTs were actually uh, included in this meta-analysis. And we have about two uh, about 2,500 overweight and obese participants from 14 countries. The intervention group is actually those that practicing on IF, whether it be ADF or the TRF. The control group is actually those that practicing on usual diet without intervention. Compare group is those that undergo uh, try on CER. And the mean duration is actually uh, three months time. And the outcome we are looking at is actually the weight, BMI, waist conference, fasting glucose, blood lipids, blood pressure, insulin. Okay, so if you look at the results, so IF versus CER, there, are, there is no significant difference between uh, IF and CER for all parameters except for this waist conference. So in conclusion, IF is actually as effective as CER for as one of the weight loss method. Okay, so interestingly, this systematic review also did a subgroup analysis looking at the uh, different type of intermittent fasting. So this result actually showed that the, for ADF versus C, uh, CER, so there are no difference between ADF and CER on weight and other cardiometabolic markers. 
Whereas for time restricted feeding versus CER, right? So uh, weekly TRF was more effective than CER in reducing waist conference, fat, fatness, diastolic blood pressure than the CER. Okay, so the recommendations for practice at the moment is that it is effective uh, for IF as a long short-term weight loss, uh, and the results similar to daily caloric restriction. But diet still this diet still needs to be closely monitored. So we actually tailored to individual and we must make sure that the nutrient is adequate. And it's actually not suitable for everyone, especially those that who cannot uh, fast for too long. For example, patients with diabetes on insulin. Yeah. So and at the moment, there's not enough evidence to recommend an ideal fasting regimen. So therefore, more studies are actually required. Okay. So now we move on to another diet that is actually quite popular for weight loss. It's actually ketogenic diet. I think it's actually quite popular now. So the popular ketogenic diet uh, we hear is actually the uh, 70 to 80 percent of fat uh, from of the overall total caloric, uh, five to ten percent carbs, and ten to twenty percent of protein. So of course there's another type is a clinical ketogenic diet that we actually uh, use it under supervised clinical use for specific medical conditions like for example uh, seizure patients uh, with patients okay so essentially ketogenic diets promote a pseudo uh, fasted state so after three to four days of fasting and following a low carb diet so body deprived for sugar and starch reduce insulin secretion and therefore switch fat to become a fuel yeah, so as you can see from the slides, right, these are the generally what food allowed and not allowed uh, when they, when someone practice on ketogenic diet. So allowed is of course those that are high fat, like for example, cream, butter, uh, high fat food, uh, cocoa powder and all that. So not recommend is actually those that are carbs and sugar and also those uh, starchy vegetables. Okay, so how about the effectiveness of it? So this meta-analysis actually conducted in 2020, looking at the impact of low-carb and low-fat diets on weight change and also for lipid levels. So the lipid level, uh, lipids uh, panel they're looking at is actually the total cholesterol, LDL, HDL and triglycerides in adult population. Okay, so we look at the results. So uh, this is actually for weight loss. So the 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 overall the average overall results actually favor to a low carb diet. Yeah. So but however the p value is actually not significant. Okay. So for LDL, the overall results actually favor to a low fat diet, and the p value is actually significant. So especially for the first uh one year when they practice on this low-fat diet, actually the LDL results is actually stati statistically significant that it's actually reduced. So for HDL, overall favor to low-carb diet. Yeah, so for total cholesterol, it's actually similar to LDL, favor to low-fat diet is especially significant for the first one year. Yeah, so for triglycerides, overall favor low-carb diet and the p-value is actually significant. Okay, so the conclusions from the, the meta-analysis is that low carbs diet were more beneficial for weight loss, HDL and triglycerides uh, in short term. Yeah, nevertheless, the benefits must be balanced with the potential harm that actually a low fat diet, uh, a, uh, sorry, a, a high fat diet actually may actually bring to, to uh, causing this, this lipidemia. Yeah, because of the, the, the nature of the diet. So ultimately, the choice of the diet, right, is actually tailored to put, uh, the patient's baseline, like, uh, the baseline readings. Okay, so how, so now we're actually looking into like the dietary carbohydrates intake and mortality. So this actually published in 2018, looking at the mortality rate of the, if someone actually practicing on like a low carb diet and a high carb diet. Yeah. Okay, so we can see from the results here is that the results can, uh, it's actually a U-shaped associations between percentage of energy from carbs and all cause mortality. So a both low carb consumption, which is actually less than 40%, and high carb consumption, more than 70%, actually uh, impose higher, greater mortality risk. Yeah, so low carb diet also depends on like what they actually substitute with. So if let's say they substitute with the animal derived uh, uh, sources, like for example, beef, lambs, chicken, all that, uh, this actually will be higher risk of mortality. But if let's say the replacement is actually more on the plant-based uh, sources, uh, that actually will impose a lower uh, mortality rate. 
Okay, so this is actually a US news published every year. So this is the latest in 2023, looking at the overall best diets, uh, best diets overall. So 24 diets were evaluated with the input of a panel of health experts. So we can see that keto diets actually ranked number 20 out of 24. So it's actually the best diets with best fast weight loss diets number one but it's actually the last for best heart healthy diets and also the last few for the best diets for the healthy eating okay so is keto diet safe so at the moment we need more studies to actually prove on that but now academy of nutrition and dietetics mentioned that it is not recommended for individuals with pancreatic disease liver issue thyroid issue patients that with history or currently having is, uh, eating disorders, gallbladder issues, or those that who have done cholecystectomy, and also those with diabetic ketoacidosis. So in conclusion, long-term studies uh, to provide a robust evidence to actually modulating dietary macronutrients compositions to achieve a better weight loss uh, outcome that is uh, it not not is failed. Uh, there is no long-term studies on that. So the optimal diet to treat obesity should be safe, effective, nutritionally adequate, culturally acceptable, and economically uh, affordable. But most importantly, is the long-term compliance of the patient. So the last message is that no one size fits all. Ultimately, uh, individualized plan is required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wong, for your sharing. And for the first half of today's webinar, the last speaker, we have Ms. Sylvia Chong, Principal Physiotherapist, who will be sharing on common conditions seen in primary care and role of rehabilitation. Over to you, Ms. Chong. Uh, good afternoon, fellow doctors and dear colleague. I'm Sylvia Chong, Principal Physiotherapist from Glen Eagles Hospital. I'm very honoured to be invited to uh, talk during this Glen Eagles annual medical seminar. So today I will share about common conditions seen in primary care and the role of rehabilitation. Most commonly patients with uh, pain coming from musculoskeletal condition will seek medical treatment. So we all know um, the vicious cycle of pain. So with pain come muscle tension, then causes reduced circulation then causes reduce, uh, muscle inflammation, reduced movement, then this cycle will continue. So with rehab, our role here is to help with a uh, healing process in each phase to help break the cycle. So some of the common condition based on body segments, for example, for spinal condition, conditions such as spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, this prolapse and neck and back pain will benefit from physio. Other upper limb conditions, such as um, rotator cuff injury, frozen shoulder, tennis elbow, uh, golfer's elbow, all these from sports or overuse injuries. Next, we go to the lower limb injuries, um, such as patella tendinopathy, knee or hip osteoarthritis, Achilles tendinitis, or plantar fasciitis. So a typical session of physiotherapy will involve a detailed assessment of the patient. The therapist next will discuss about the treatment plan and what's available uh, for the patients. Both our Glen Eagles and uh, Camden side uh, have well-equipped gym with the latest uh, electrotherapy modalities such as functional trainer and shockwave therapy. The treatment generally will be a good mix of manual therapy, exercise and electrotherapy. So based on research, guided exercise program has been shown to significantly reduce the need for surgery for patients with conditions such as subacromial impingement syndrome. So exercise group has also reported better improvement in outcome measures. For knee osteoarthritis, a combination of manual physiotherapy and supervised exercise has been shown to provide functional benefits for patients and to decrease the need for surgical intervention. Next, we go in-depth a bit in a not-so-commonly-seen electrotherapy, shockwave therapy. So shockwave therapy uses similar technology to, like, to break up kidney and gallstones. 
So it has been shown to provide pain relief, tissue regeneration, and destruction or calcification. So it's indicated based on a few studies for cases such as tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, rotator calf tendinitis, Achilles tendinitis. Generally, the required session will be about four to six sessions to provide such benefit. Another specialized uh, assessment that's available here would be our gait analysis. So most commonly, poor running technique is a leading cause of lower limb injuries. So when we run, usually we thought that we actually look like Usain Bolt. In fact, we actually look like the other guy that with the poor posture and all. So for gait analysis, a brief test on the treadmill will provide information that otherwise a mystery for, to the runner. So the treadmill will record step length, step speed and step symmetry so by reading through all this gait analysis, we'll be able to tailor our exercise for conditions such as uh, greater trochanteric pain syndrome, ITB friction syndrome, knee conditions such as patella uh, tendinopathy, and ankle conditions. Talking about running, for our podiatrist colleague, they will also be able to assist with lower limb injuries such as high arch or low arch foot type they'll be able to treat this by prescribing proper uh, custom-made insoles, also provide advice on running shoes. Next, we go into our occupational therapy colleague. So they are specialized in upper limb related hand injuries. So such as like fractures, uh, sprain, ligament injury, or other repetitive strain injuries, such as a uh, couple tunnel syndrome. They'll be able to treat all these conditions by providing a uh, range of motion exercises, upper limb functional retraining, ultrasound, kinesio taping, and also uh, heat therapy. Also custom-made uh, spleen for patients based on condition. Next, we move into uh, other conditions that will benefit from rehab. So neurological conditions such as stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, Parkinson's disease or geriatric conditions from our elderly population, dementia, delirium, general weakness, or even caregiver stress. So all these conditions will benefit widely from all our allied health uh, colleagues itself. So for physio, we'll focus more on balance, strengthening, uh, prescribing the proper walking aids, and also giving pain management for patients with musculoskeletal related issues. For occupational therapy, they will focus more on task-oriented functional training, modified techniques for uh, activities of daily living, and also cognitive retraining, sensory re-education. Other treatments include uh, also providing caregiver training, uh, giving advice on the proper assistive device such as like wheelchair, motorized scooter. They are also able to provide home assessment and home modification. Also help our patient to go back into their community. Next, we go into speech therapy. They are a group of allied health that specialize in language and speech related pathology. Uh, so they will help to treat patients with swallowing difficulty by providing assessments such as video fluoroscopy, also communication and swallowing post tracheostomy, voice therapy. So for voice therapy is one of our specialized uh, niche service for speech therapists. Uh, it's actually suitable for patients with voice disorder developed from overuse or misuse of voice. Uh, some other common voice-related conditions include like hoarse voice, vocal cord paralysis, uh, vocal nodules, or vocal cord problems. Besides this, we also have some other specialized services which include uh, golf rehabilitation, lymphedema management, weight management, and pediatric physiotherapy. So a quick glance of uh, Parkway Rehab at Glen Eagles. So currently we have two locations, one location at uh, Level 3 Annex building, 
The other location that is newly opened in 2022 April is at Camden, one stop away from Glen Eagles. So in short, uh, Parkway Rehab at Glen Eagles and Camden is able to provide personalized rehabilitation services which include uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, podiatry, and home care services for all our patients. Our focus is to help patients to manage impairment and regain your ability to perform day-to-day -day activities after certain medical conditions. Many of our therapists are actually hold uh, clinical certification in areas such as manual therapy, manipulation therapy, sports rehabilitation, golf rehabilitation, and clinical pilates. A short intro of our team, there's a total of 10 physiotherapists currently. We specialize in diagnosis, management, and prevention of movement disorder. Our occupational therapists uh, specialize in uh, upper limb injuries and also to help our patients to perform day-to-day -day activities. Our speech therapists who specialize in speech language pathology and swallowing difficulties. All our therapists are regulated under a light health profession council, AHPC in Singapore, and are formally recognized by our Singapore Medical Council. So if any of you are interested or you have patients that are suitable, will benefit from rehab, please contact uh, Camden site as this number. Both our site uh, accept referral via walk-ins or doctor referrals or our own Parkway Rehab referral. We also accept a uh, cashless payment. This is our Glen Eagle site uh, contact number. Okay, so thank you. That's the end of my talk today. Thank you, Ms. Chong, for your sharing. And Ms. Chong, together with the rest of the speakers for the first half of the webinar, they are now ready for the panel discussion. So if you have any questions for them, please feel free to type into the Q&A section in the Zoom, which is just below. Click on the Q&A, key in your questions, and we will try our very best to address your questions during the panel discussion. You may also make an appointment with specialists at Glen Eagles Hospital for referrals for your patients to see Glen Eagles Hospital specialists Within one day, you may use the hotline, uh, do use the hotline or WhatsApp to message to the number available on the screen. So you can see the screen, we have a hotline and the WhatsApp number. Do take note of this, you may take a screenshot so that we can assist you to arrange to see Glen Eagles Hospital Specialist within one day. All right, thank you so much once again. Without further ado, I would also like to invite our speakers from the first half of this webinar. We have Dr. Tan Chun Hai, Dr. Eric Koo, Ms. Wong Hui Mei, and Ms. Sylvia Chong for this panel discussion. Also, not forgetting moderating this discussion, we have Dr. Vivian Lin, endocrinologist practicing at Glen Eagles Hospital. So, without further ado, I'll hand over the time to Dr. Vivian Lin and our speakers and panelists. Well, thank you very much uh, to our. Well, thank you very much for our chairperson. Um, I'm Vivian Lin. Glen Eagles. Now, um, thank you for Glen Eagles for asking me to moderate this talk, uh, which is symposia, which is really close to my heart. And it's excellent that Glen Eagles actually acknowledges and recognizes the fact that obesity is a huge, huge problem with such a high prevalence um, in Singapore. And that it is the root cause, actually, of many, many evils, including cancers. Now, I have to say that, in fact, um, in obesity prevalence, if we use the Asian standard of obesity levels, uh, which is 27.5, immediately the obesity prevalence would have doubled in Singapore already. And if you include those who are overweight and those with abdominal obesity, the majority of Singaporeans are overweight and obese. So you can see how big a problem it is. And this is a wonderful thing. If you're in this panel, you can actually see uh, the whole team, the multidisciplinary team here that deals with obesity. And so without further ado, now I'm going to direct some questions to them. I'm going to start then uh, in no order of preference uh, with, with uh, our endocrinology team. So Dr. Koo, uh, how high is the risk of cancer with GLP-1 agonist? Well, in terms of cancer risk with GLP-1 per se, there's, there's really very little. I mean, if you're thinking about the Madari thyroid cancer risk with uh, GLP-1 agonist, it, it's very low. Uh, firstly, it's only picked up in rodents and 
they have a preponderance of Madari thyroid cells in these, uh, these animals. For human beings, the, the, these cell, cell lines are very few, so the incidence is very low. Okay, now I'm going to pass this on now next to my dietitian colleague, somebody that I work very closely with and I feel is so, so important. Now, would you share your current practice or any evidence that you currently are aware of on intermittent fasting as a weight loss tool in adolescence? Mm -hmm. uh. Hey, okay, hi, hi, I'm Hui Mei. Yeah, so uh, for intermittent fasting, yes, I mean, for uh, for adult, yes, it's actually something that we will, uh, I mean, as in like we will assess in terms of their diet if let's say they are practicing on intermittent fasting. I will have to make sure that uh, their diet has to be still balanced, yet the calorie is well controlled. For adolescents, um, we actually not so much of patients at the moment that is actually practicing on intermittent fasting, but it's just that for adolescents that would be a challenge is that right we have to they are still growing, so um so we have to make sure that the minimal requirement uh, for growing will be still there, uh to make sure that their nutrition is adequate while they are practicing on intermittent fasting. Okay, excellent. Now I'm going to on to the next question. I'm going to go to my surgical colleague then who has for the longest period of time been very proud of the fact that they have the cure to diabetes uh, with uh, bariatric surgery for obesity. Now I just wanted to point out that you know um, one of the audience pointed out that uh, Dr. Koo was correct to point out that obesity is more than a BMI. Uh, with this in mind in healthy obesity is there a true subset uh, within global obesity? And if so, how is healthy obesity identified and differentiated from unhealthy obesity? Um, and I just wanted to point out here, I don't think he was pointing out that it's, he didn't point out the fact that uh, it is more than BMI, which means that it's healthy. It's that there are very, there are different markers of obesity. And one of them is a waist circumference um, and not just the BMI. Not to point out the fact that, you know, if, if, you are in the obese range that you're healthy because there are lots and lots of concepts of health health and it's not just metabolic that's also physical that's also mental and um and i would just like to ask uh, dr tan uh, do you get to see this subset what do you think is there a subset of healthy obese individuals yes thank you for a very good question <clears throat> maybe um maybe i'll correct you a little bit we don't cure diabetes we uh <laughs> Diabetes, we will never cure them. We put them into remission and sometimes they come back, but they come back at a much uh, less severe intensity. But yes, let's talk about, let's talk about um, obesity and the healthy range. I've seen patients of BMI 32, 35 and they look fit, they look healthy. We also look at percentage fat mass, percentage uh, muscle, muscle mass. Uh, waist circumference. I think it's a combination of all these factors that actually we look at to see whether the patient is at uh, high risk or low risk and whether they qualify for some of our, um, our uh, techniques or medications or surgery. Uh, we also have to look at their lifestyle and how is their body built. So if you compare uh, an athlete with a very low percentage fat and a high BMI, would you call that the uh, obese patients? Uh, not really. Uh, on the other hand, we have a high percentage fat mass and uh, BMI borderline. Do you call that obese patients? I think this is a very debatable issue that's been ongoing in all our conferences. I think identification of the patient is also very important in our, our field as well. Um, anything to add then, uh, Dr. Koo? No, I think it's this. very well answered. <laughs> I, think, I think the other important thing is, is what you highlighted earlier. The physical impact, the complications, the mental issues, and the psychological issues as well. So if there are more complications, despite the fact that their BMI is low, then I think they, they warrant a further, further treatment and a more aggressive approach to their and, management. And do remember that BMI is actually a spectrum. It's just like glucose, it's just like cholesterol levels. Yeah? There's no absolute cutoff points here that we are talking about here. And it's, it's individualized for different uh, patients. And that doesn't mean that at this point of time, if you don't truly see any issues, it doesn't mean that subtly in the body, 
it doesn't have any issues. Or what about five years in the future, ten years in the future? So that's something to think about. Uh, now I've, I'm going to go, go to uh, our physiotherapist, Sylvia. Now it's that's actually she's actually also a great part of the obesity team. I would like to just ask you, what are the challenges you see? Where's the role of physiotherapy in obesity? As in, as in, when would you like us to send you the patients? So I think uh, for obese patients, the great challenge comes with the mindset identifying what is the root cause that are causing them to have these issues. So, um, so diet and exercise, people always talk about this two bit when we are managing um, obesity. So most patients that are obese, highly likely is they have very sedentary lifestyle to begin with. Exercise is just not their cup of tea. Most people want to find an easy way out. So the challenge for physio will be Education would be the first big part of it, um, telling them that why they should start moving, get um, physical activity in their daily lives. It doesn't need to be a proper exercise session. It can be just something like changing from a seated desk to a standing desk, walking around, increasing your step count day to day, combining it slowly with diet rather than um, strict start with exercise. Of course, other challenging factor would be based on if the patient who is obese is also old at the same time, age component, they may have other issues like um, muscle aches, joint aches, pain that like prevent them from doing exercises. So then it will come in from physio bit to maybe we need to resolve that bit before we can engage more active exercise lifestyle for the patient. And through the whole modification, then we help them in terms of maintaining healthy lifestyle and healthy weight. I, I totally hear you because I've got patients who are really, really obese. We're talking about um, class three and above, and, and they can't even walk. And, and when you ask them about exercise, they say, I, I walk 17 steps from my table, from my bed to the door. And they actually count that. Um, okay, so I'm, I've, I see a lot of patient, people are very worried um, about the side effects that come from GLP-1s, especially with, with all the sensationalization and the reports which are out there in the newspapers. So we're thinking about side effects such as gastroparesis, uh, intestinal obstruction, things like suicidal ideation and depression. Uh, is this a real problem that we're seeing? What is the, what's your view, Dr. Ku? <laughs> Thank you for directing this very important uh, side effects and effects that are seen. So I think, uh, firstly, it's important to identify the group that you want to treat, identify who you want to treat and with what. Explain to the individual why you're treating them and also discuss the, the effects and the side effects as well. Um, gastroparesis, intestinal obstruction are actually effects of the medication as well. It's just, the, it's just to what extent. So as we said earlier, when we start off medication, we should start on a low dose, gradually building up to make sure that there are minimal side effects and then gradually increasing up to the maximum tolerable to get the benefits. So that's from the gastroparesis side of things. With regards to the mood and the depression and suicidal risk, I think that's, that's a little bit more uh, contentious. We don't know whether it's directly related to the product itself. Um, various health, in, health agencies in Europe have already issued a warning. In Singapore, there's also a bit of a warning, but there's no conclusive evidence at, at, at this point in time. If we take a step back and look at this population itself, they are at high risk of... Um, depression, anxiety, just based on their own efforts of how to manage their own condition. At the same time, how the treatment itself may also entail some of these uh, uh, side effects and, and symptoms as well. In fact, some, of the one, some observational studies have shown that even the weight loss itself causes increased risk of these anxiety, depression symptoms as well. So it's very difficult at the moment to tease out what, what um, is actually causing these incidents, but definitely um, the, the, there's a bit of a interest in this and we just need to wait for more, more evidence and more information before we can conclusively um, attribute it or not attribute it to the medication itself. The other important thing is as we, as we give the medication, we also want to make sure that we can close the loop. So access to the physicians or the healthcare 
individuals who have prescribed this medication is important and early intervention and early review is also uh, equally, equally important as well. Well, I totally agree with you on that point. Uh, good answer. Now, also, I think that everything with every medication, you need to look at the pros and cons. Now, this, this, all the side effects that came out reminds me of the bisphosphonate scare and everybody starts stopping using bisphosphonates of, of getting the fact that osteoporosis and a hip fracture can actually lead to increased risk of mortality. So similarly here, I mean, the, uh, the, the risk of obesity should not be underestimated. We, this is not now, lots of data coming out that is increasing the risk of cancer and also a great, great contributor of uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis as well as cirrhosis of the liver, not to mention all the rest that uh, Dr. Eric Koo had pointed out. Now, I have to pass the baton now to our bariatric surgeon. <laughs> uh, just question then, you know, BMI is just an assessment uh, of the body fat. How good assessment is it of a body fat? And then how in your practice you decide then uh, which of the sur surgical techniques that you want. You want a sleeve or would you like to have a gastric bypass? Um, <clears throat> I think the BMI is, uh, BMI stands for body mass index. So it's calculated with uh, weight divided by height square in meters. Um, body fat, on the other hand, is a per percentage of uh, whether your body composition of muscle, fat, water, and the other contents. How we decide whether we take on uh, which surgery and which technique for each patient has to be individualized. For example, <clears throat> a patient with BMI 60, uh, we will have to consider the risk of taking on a room wide gastric bypass versus a sleeve first technique or some form of bridge therapy, maybe a balloon or maybe uh, with uh, injectable uh, ozempic, saxenda, uh, then surgery, um, or we have to talk about, um, let's say, a bulk eater, somebody who likes to eat bulk, who eats a lot of rice, a lot of uh, carbohydrates, versus somebody who takes a lot more sweets, somebody who likes chocolate, sweets, muffins. I think also have to be individualized to what uh, uh, the patient's condition is if the patient more has got uh, has got diabetes, and we know that for long term, five to ten years, and ten years out, a room wide gastric bypass beats the sleeve uh, up front. But sleeve is better for short term; uh, it's uh, less risky. Uh, so I think we have to discuss this with the patient and uh, what does the patient want and what do we want to achieve in the short term, medium term, and long term uh, prospect for the patient. Well, thank you very much, Then I think uh, no, we are nearing the end already because we have time limit and time constraints. Now, I have to say that you know, obesity is huge. And we all acknowledge now that how important it is uh, because, as I mentioned, it, it's causing lots and lots of other downstream effects. So you, instead of just treating the downstream effects, we should prevent it or we should also treat the upstream root cause of the evils. Now, with the advent of GLP-1s when we are, and bariatric surgery, where we are seeing great weight loss and with, and with it, mortality and mobility benefits now, we have come to obesity medicine itself. And this is the team in obesity medicine. And hopefully in the future, with more and more data coming out, we'll be able to tackle this big problem and halt that tsunami of uh, this pandemic of diabetes as well, uh, diabetes as in diabetes and obesity. Now, with that, I would like to thank the panelists, this wonderful obesity multidisciplinary unit, uh, with Glen Eagles Hospital for acknowledging and recognizing this big issue, and with the audience for staying with us uh, throughout. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vivian Lim, for moderating this panel discussion, and also thank you to our speakers, Dr. Ku, Dr. Tan, Ms. Wong, and Ms. Sylvia, for your sharing. Indeed, it's very, very engaging. And before we commence the second portion of today's webinar, the topic on active and healthy ageing, we have another poll question for you. And in this poll question, it takes you back to earlier on, Mr Thomas Wee, the CEO of Glen Eagles Hospital, mentioned this in his opening speech. Glen Eagles is a model of active ageing as well. So how old is Glen Eagles Hospital this year? Have you got the numbers right? 59, 60, 64 or 70 years? We'd like to invite everyone to be involved in this polling and let's see if you can get the right answer. <coughs> and
And let's see, is it 59, 60, 64, or 70? All right. Okay. And yes, okay. So I'm sure most of you got it correct. It's actually 64, yes. Right, so yes, Glenigals is a model of active aging too. We are fit, healthy, and 64 years old. Uh, years old this year. So we are staying current by continuously upgrading our infrastructure from sheltered walkways, facility enhancements, renovating our operating theatre and bringing in new equipment for the OT equipment to strengthen our capabilities and support your practice. Glen Eagles treasures this partnership with you and we will support your practice to deliver good medical outcomes. All right, to the second half of today's webinar, Without further ado, let us resume and invite Dr. Christopher Chong, urogynecologist, obstetrician and gynecologist for his presentation update in the management of stress urinary incontinence. Dr. Chong, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending your time on a Saturday afternoon for the annual scientific meeting of the Glen Eagles Hospital. Hope everyone is well. Today, my talk is on a very, very uh, common problem which many people tend to ignore and is an, giving you an update on the management of stress incontinence, how we can stop the leak in just 10 minutes. I'm Christopher Chong. I'm an obstetrician. Obstetricians deliver babies. I'm a gynecologist. We deal with other female issues as well, such as fibroids, ovarian cysts, menstrual problem, fertility as well. I'm a fertility specialist and uh, I'm subspecialized in urogynecology. In urogynecology, we look at this. The front of the body is the bladder. Behind the bladder is the womb. Behind the womb is the intestine. And these three organs are supported by the same set of muscles. So you have a problem with one, your neighbour is likely to be involved as well. Which is why urogynecology was developed many years ago. So that you have three problems, you see one doctor rather than seeing three doctors. So these are the set of organs that we see supported by the same set of muscles. As a urogynecologist, we are sub-specialized in urinary leakage problem, pelvic organ prolapse, bladder issues, frequency urgency, fistula problems, and even sexual issues. This is the beautiful uh, Great Ocean Road, 12 Apostles. That's where I did my sub-specialty training in Melbourne, Australia. The beautiful view you can get there. Now back to incontinence. Incontinence is complaint of any involuntary leakage of urine. And Howard Kelly, as far as 1928, has said, there's no more distressing lesion than urinary, urinary incontinence, a constant dribbling of the repulsive urine soaking the clothes, which cling wet and cold to the thigh and making the patient offensive to herself, her family, and ostracizing her from society. So stress urinary incontinence is uh, uncontrollable leakage of urine from coughing, sneezing, running, jumping. And... Uh, this is what we see in the clinic and outside the clinic, a real problem. And the cause include childbirth, which is the most common problem, menopause, and in this day in, of age in Singapore, obesity, because human beings stand up, they have a big fat tummy pressing on the pelvic floor muscles all the time. Look at this photo. Childbirth. We know how big the vagina is and how much the baby said goes through and tear some muscles. So if the person does not recover well or does not take care of him, herself well after delivery, sometimes the healing will not be good. Prolapse and incontinence can occur. Incontinence can have psychological, physical, social, sexual and occupational problem. Sometimes you even can have leakage of urine during sexual intercourse, but this is often due to an overactive bladder. What about people who have never delivered baby before. A study done in the uh, UK on 4,211 nulliparous women never delivered a uh, kid before and they found that 16% of them have leakage of urine every day. And these are done on nursing students. Reason being that they are born with weak collagen and also they carry heavy patients without doing the pelvic floor exercise. So how big is this problem in Singapore? There was no study, so I decided to do a national study in Singapore. 
And I surveyed 3,500 women across the whole island. It took me almost, almost a year to complete. And we found that if you're above the age of 50, at least one in three, or 35.8% of them will have leakage of urine at least once a day. And this is such a common problem. When we ask them whether they think that it is normal, less than 15% think it's normal. They know it's not normal. But yet, when we ask them whether it's treatable, only one-third think it can be treated. The rest think it think it cannot be treated. And where to seek treatment? Majority do not know where to seek treatment. And even if they were to consult a doctor, they consulted a GP more than a specialist. So the role of the GP is very important in uh, helping out these people. After seeing the GP, how, why is it that so few will end up seeing a, a specialist? Often, not uncommonly, sometimes GP may even tell them it's part of growing old, which should not be the case. That study of mine is one of the largest in the world, smaller than the 27,000, which was just a poster survey. So will this problem continue to rise in Singapore? The answer is yes. And uh, incontinence, the prevalence is actually higher than hypertension, diabetes and depression. But why is so little done is because it does not kill you, but it affects your life. This day, we should move not just on to good health, but good quality of life. And it starts from pregnancy. So if you are pregnant and you have leakage of urine, three months after delivery, you have leakage of urine, this group of people, 92% will still be leaking at the end of five years. So it's where uh, urinary leakage starts and pelvic floor muscles are damaged. And very often, we, you do a urodynamic study. To me, it's mandatory to do a urodynamic study before any surgery is offered to better understand the bladder and to better select the type of surgery to be done. And this is our urodynamic study where a tube is put into the bladder, one tube with the anus, water is run at a regular rate into the bladder and how the bladder behaves is seen on the computer like this. And this is one reason, important reason is also to differentiate this from overactive bladder which presents with frequency, urgency, and if you can't hold urine enough, you leak urine. Different from coughing, seizing, running, leaking urine. Treatment of stress incontinence can be physiotherapy, vaginal pessaries, medication, or surgery. Of course, you can wear pad if you don't want surgery. And uh, physiotherapy is called the Kegels or pelvic floor exercise. You need to do for three to six months before actual full effect. And you actually squeeze the anus and vagina tight and let go as often as you can. And after doing for three months, and if you still leak urine, then we offer you surgery. Sometimes we use vagina cones to put in the vagina so that patient can use the vagina to squeeze the cone to know how to do the pelvic floor exercise. And the cone sizes will re reduce over the months so they grip more and more and become stronger and stronger. We also use um, electrical stimulation to teach a patient which muscles to contract. Of course, nobody likes surgery. So, someone in the world came up with this electromagnetic chair. You sit on this chair for 20 minutes every week for 8 to 12 weeks. Success rate was quoted to be up to 40%. In Singapore, we did it for 3 patients and all failed. We don't do it anymore. What about medication? Duloxetine acts on the serotonin receptors of the urethra. This will cause the urethra to close. So, studies done by Peggy Morton in 2022, this is FDA approved, found that Compared to placebo, the higher the dosage of duloxetine, the better the treat treatment and cure for urinary incontinence stress-wise. And it, reaches, uh, it reached a value of up to 64%. But the higher the dose, unfortunately, the more the complication, most common of which is nausea, giddiness, headache. And in recent years, they found that in the States, it increased the risk of suicidal tendencies. So in Singapore, we don't use it. Then that leaves us with surgery. What form of surgery? Retropubic suspension as well as slings are the most efficacious. This is the most quoted study in the world on uh, urinary incontinence results. Paper by Jarvis. So for objective cure, it's the best two methods are still copper suspension, 89.8%, sling, 93.9%. And even for recurrence, it's still copper suspension, 82.5%, and sling 
So this bird corpus suspension, it used to be the gold standard for treatment of stress urinary incontinence. And uh, it was all the way in the 1960s when uh, Birch uh, did this surgery. Accidentally, he was doing a MMK surgery, stitching onto the bone, but he stitched onto the iliopectinal ligament instead and found that it worked. So he put stitches onto the bladder wall and hitch up the bladder to the iliopectinal ligament. In an experienced surgeon in Singapore, who had done more than 700 cases in, in history, in a public hospital, the largest amount of blood loss was 5 litres. Second on record was 3.5 litres. So even in very good hands, this surgery can be quite dangerous. And there was one case where during the surgery, there was so much bleeding, the stitch broke, the needle broke. So I was called in to help and I used um, omentum to pack into the area. We couldn't do any more surgery because there was so much blood. So we packed the area and closed up. Three weeks later, under ultrasound, uh, X-ray guidance, we went in with uh, Professor V.T. Joseph, a very good surgeon, and removed that needle. So even in very good hands, birch corpus suspension can have many complications and can be very dangerous. This is birch corpus suspension, but laparoscopic uh, surgery. This is one of my cases. So laparoscopic was brought in to try to improve and reduce the bleeding. Unfortunately, the learning curve for laparoscopy is very high. And also because of less bleeding, less fibrosis, success rate was not as good as open birch. So then, can we do something else? Then came the slings, started in 1995 uh, by Umstead and Nielsen. And it was is now the gold standard by the blind procedures. And so different individuals had different results and experiences. And uh, Singapore, we are very lucky. We are the first uh, few countries, first two countries in Asia to do this surgery. Myself and my colleague, uh, did the first case in 1998 um, and to date both of us have done more than 10,000 combined together with very good results. And the Royal College of ONG exam, postgraduate exam, the model answer for treatment of stress, urinary incontinence is still the tension-free vag vaginal tape or the sling surgery. So the, the sling surgery basically is to, uh, um, the mode of action is by causing outlet obstruction. So you put the sling under the neck of the bladder and once you exert, it hits the bladder, the bladder closes, you don't leak urine. So these are the equipment used for the tension-free vaginal tape. This is the original one that started in 1998 in Singapore. So the surgery, so that's the tape we are looking at. The bladder is drained of urine. Injection is given locally. This can be done under local anesthesia. Injection into the vaginal bladder wall. We make a small little cut just under the urethra and do lateral dissection to the obdurator space. So this poking is just uh, for demonstration. Normally we don't do that. yeah. So the bladder is deviated away. The instrument is now put in under the bladder behind the pubic bone and it comes out in the suprapubic area above the pubic tubercle. There we are. Cystoscope is done to make sure that bladder tape has not gone into the bladder. The same thing is done on the other side and the sling pulled into place, like forming like a U shape. It looks a bit scary, but actually isn't that scary and not that painful either. So the tape is put into position and the plastic sheet is removed. Once the plastic sheet is removed, the bristle-like thing in the tape will get stuck to the tissue, so you don't need to stitch. So that's why it's called tension-free. And the tape is cut off from the skin. So when we pull on the tape from the top, you see, we pull on, the tape is not moving from its position once it's fixed. And uh, leather area is stitched. This surgery is, takes about 10 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes. So comparing to Perth Scopus suspension, in our series done in a public hospital, we have a higher success rate from this procedure. Complications include bleeding, injury to the bladder, you can injure even the intestine sometimes if you push too, so too much above the suprapubic area. And uh, in the world, there are other 
injuries such as hematoma, vascular injury. Thankfully, in Singapore, our injury rate is very, very, very low. So this is what we saw just now, a sling procedure. Right, the potential problem as mentioned can be bladder perforation, hematoma, need for cystoscopy, bowel perforation, and can irritate the bladder to have overactive bladder symptom of frequency, urgency, and urge incontinence. So we progress. Can we do better? So that's why transobdurator technique came about. This is that mesh again. And the green one is the normal pubo-ureter ligament. The transobdurator technique follows this path of that ligament, so it's more natural. But the area of safety is only about 4 cm away from the obdurator vessels. So we have to be very careful and very sure where to insert the, the mesh and the troca and the sling. And uh, this is a blind procedure. So now we look at the surgery for the transobdurator tape. Same thing, empty the bladder. We make markings, very, very strict markings, 2 cm up from the urethra on the fold and 2 cm outwards after that. Injection of uh, lignocaine and pitrocine into the area below the uh, urethra. And the small cut is only about 1 cm or so. Lateral dis dissection, just like the previous method. But now the exit point, not the suprapubic area, the exit point is the inner thigh. So this is a, a wing guide to guide where the troca goes in. And this is the instrument. We push deep to the obdurator. Once we reach there, you see there's a gift. We reach the obdurator. Push once more, we are through to pass the obdurator muscles and curve and come out at the exit point on the most lateral point that we have already pre-marked. There we are. And then the troca is removed. As you notice, there's hardly any blood loss. And the same thing is done on the other side. And the sling pulled into place. This tape is left loose so that there's no voiding disorder. If you place too tight, you can have avoiding disorder. So there's a small space between uh, the bladder area and the tape and the plastic is removed and the tape is left loose like that. And the area is stitched. Usually we can do this uh, in less than 10 minutes, um, about seven minutes or so. No cystoscopy is uh, required, so there's no less danger of hematoma or injury to the bladder or the intestine. And the success rate is about the same as that of the tension-free vaginal, vaginal tape original. So for my first 200 cases follow-up for 24 months, success was 94%, improvement 2%, failure 4%. Complication of thigh pain and voiding problem is in the region of just 1%. We published some of our um, data in the International Euro Gynae Journal, follow up for three years. Success rate is still very high with low complications. And comparing to birch copper suspension, we have better results, less hospital stay, and less pain, and less blood loss, certainly. So can we do even better? Some people thought there would be thigh pain because the exit point was in the inner thigh. So they decided to put a small sling without coming out through the thigh. This we tried for three on, on 30 cases, even though some other Places have high, quite high results. On our first 30 cases, we only achieved 67% success. So compared to a, the, or the tension-free vaginal, vaginal tape obdurator of 90%, then we shouldn't be doing this. So we stopped doing this, uh, using this method uh, of the secure. So as far as 2008, 2011, 2013, there were warnings of mesh erosion issues. And some countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Scotland, band mesh and sling was also banned. But in Asia, we have been doing very well with very, very good results. Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan. 
and Singapore. You know, just because we are control, we have a control of who were to do this surgery, that they must be trained. Otherwise, they cannot do this surgery. For example, the mesh in Singapore, only two doctors are doing the surgery. So we are very strict with our criteria and our complication rate, very, very low, with good success. But of course, everything comes with complication. It's not so beautiful and simple. The more we do, the more complication we, we get. That's true. The more we do, the better we are. And the more we do, the less complications. That is also true. So complication of this sling include erosion, this tape erosion, another tape erosion, more erosion, but this is a different type of tape. Abscess can form in the suprapubic area, for example. It can also be erosion into the bladder causing stones to form. And this stone can be formed about 11 years, discovered 11 years later. This is from a friend from Taiwan, his slide. So, so all these are known things. Yeah, sometimes it can be poor stream and you erode into the urethra, for example. So how do we reduce complication by being more trained, do proper urodynamic study, use antibiotics, use empty the bladder, don't hyperflex the thigh, keep the tape loose, and training, training, and more training. So if you do this, the original method was to put the thigh like that to do the surgery, but it's very unnatural and overstrained. So we should do a normal position. There's hardly any complaint of uh, thigh pain. Skin is laid loose. And of course, if that doesn't work, we can use urethral bulking agent by injecting bulking agent into the urethra to make the opening tighter. Success rate is 30 to 70% can have erosion. So not the first line uh, method. In very bad cases, you can implant an artificial urinary sphincter in the bladder uh, urethra area to open and close the release Urine this is a complicated method. Very few people know how to do and you have to have revision. So very unusual to do it these days. Now the latest in advancement is laser. Laser causes collagen bond to reform, to be better, more elastic. So have uh, more um, power in the urethra, uh, in the levator A9 muscles as well. And the collagen around it. This is a laser machine. Put in the vagina, fire laser beam in the clinic. Hardly any pain. No anesthesia needed, just about three to five minutes. Started in Italy in 2008 for atrophy dryness, but found it's useful also because no dryness, better tissues, increase better pelvic floor muscles, and uh, can cure incontinence in the mild cases. So many studies have been done and have got good results. However, um, and this is our study when we're doing the laser for a dryness, four patients with stress incontinence after one dose. One had improvement. After three doses of the laser, three out of four had improvement but not cured. So, this mild incontinence, you can consider using laser. The results are almost as good as uh, a very good physiotherapist teaching uh, pelvic floor exercise. Moderate to severe cases, laser is known not to work. So, other future, other important things is stem cells. Stem cells can regenerate tissues. Studies are now ongoing to inject stem cells in, into the urethra to see whether it can improve the urethra closure pressure and the tissues around. So this is the future. So the most important um, message I want to pass on is there are many surgeries for stress urinary incontinence. We must choose the surgery with the best curage because the first surgery is the most important. Subsequent surgeries, even with the best surgery, will decrease the curage. So we must choose the best surgery. And we must be educated to know what the best surgery is for the patient. So in conclusion, urinary incontinence is a very common problem, often ignored. But life should not go on like that. Life expectancy for ladies is now 85. They should not suffer in silence. So, you know, we have many dreams, right? It's the C's of the Singapore. Christopher Chong has two C's or so. So cash, career, credit card, car, condominium, circling the globe, country club. I would like to include one more C, continence. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chong, for your insightful presentation. Next, I would like to have the honour to invite Dr. Wong Siu Wei, medical oncologist, to speak on the topic of lung cancer screening, redefining the strategy for the broader population. Over to you, Dr. Wong. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the organizing committee for the invitation to participate in this year's edition of annual scientific meeting. 
Along with the focus on healthy aging, the focus of my talk today will be on early lung cancer detection. My name is Dr. Wong Siu Wei. I'm a medical oncologist at Parkway Cancer Center with special interest in lung cancers, gastrointestinal cancers, and genital urinary cancers. I have received previous industry payment for speaking role and advisory board participation. Um, as part of disclosure, I do not have any special financial interest from early cancer detection kits. In Singapore, there is no national funded lung cancer screening program at present. Let's start by looking at the burden and trend of lung cancer in Singapore. As per the latest Singapore Cancer Registry annual report in 2021, Lung cancer is the third commonest cancer in both Singaporean men and women. It is the top cancer-related death in Singaporean men. Between 2016 to 2020, there were approximately 8,500 new cases diagnosed in Singapore. On the left-hand side of the screen, uh, on the, with the blue lines, it showed that over the past few decades, the incidence of lung cancers have reduced significantly in Singaporean men with a corresponding reduction in lung cancer mortality. On the right-hand side is a bit more interesting as the incidence in Singaporean women has started to plateau. The mortality continues to drop. This suggests that there are different phenomena happening with lung cancer in both Singaporean men and women. Another very concerning observation is over the past two decades, about 80% of lung cancer diagnosed in Singapore were in late stage, stage three and four. We all know that there have been tremendous advancement in lung cancer treatment over the years in the form of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. This has been brought forward into the early stage lung cancer treatment algorithm. We also have better surgical technique and better therapy technique. Another key to reduction in lung cancer mortality is prevention and early detection. In terms of prevention, we know it is uh, important for smoking cessation, but other measures such as avoidance of air pollution are a bit hard. As illustrated in the uh, graph below, lung cancer mortality drops significantly when cancers diagnosed in advanced stage. Some of us in the audience will be familiar with this New England publication called NLST trial. This trial was done in a population with heavy cigarette smoking exposure of at least 30 pack years, uh, aged between 55 to 74 years old, currently still smoking or quit less than 15 years ago. Patients were randomized between low dose CT chest versus conventional chest x-ray, which we know it has not resulted in, in any reduction in lung cancer mortality. What this trial showed was increase in detection of screen detected abnormalities from 7% to 24% and 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. Based on this NLST trial and other series from Western countries, major societies have recommended lung cancer screening in at-risk population. In Singapore, Academy of Medicine Singapore has recommended Lodo City uh, in a high risk group aligned with NLST population. And the recommendation is a category two suitable for individual level decision. US Preventive Services Task Force has a more liberal recommendation with a wider age group between 50 to 80 years old and at least 20 pack years of smoking history. With any cancer screening, we know there are major gaps in terms of capturing the at-risk population uh, to better define the eligible uh, 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 at-risk population without um, making the test not cost-effective and to increase the participation rate so that um, most at-risk patients can be diagnosed in early stage. How do we apply lung cancer screening in a broader population in Singapore? This slide show that in Singapore, if you look at the uh, green bar, that represents uh, female lung cancer patients with smoking history. In fact, 
Only 10% of female lung cancer patients in Singapore has uh, heavy smoking uh, uh, history in the past. This uh, trend is very similar to what we see in neighboring Asian countries such as Taiwan and China. In Singaporean men, uh, only about 80% has heavy smoking history. So the uh, focus to screen lung cancer only in patients with, with heavy smoking history will miss out this huge pop population of patients who are at risk. The best data we have for lung cancer screening in never smokers come from this large series called Talent Trial in Taiwan. Talent recruited healthy individuals aged between 55 to 75 with no smoking history or light smoking history of less than 10 pack years. They have to have one of the following risk factors, family history of lung cancer, passive smoking history exposure, chronic lung disease, or a unique cooking index designed by this trial team as mentioned in the uh, box on the right. All participants need to have a baseline chest x-ray to ex exclude abnormalities, and they were then um, uh, assigned to annual CT scan for two years, followed by uh, biannual CT scan for another six years. Talent trials show that baseline lung cancer detection rate in this population of healthy individuals was 2.65%, very favorable compared to a high-risk heavy smoking group in the NLST of 1.1% and 0.9% in Nelson group. Of this 2.6%, 2.1% were invasive lung cancer. In terms of number of patients with abnormal low dose CT report, it's 17% compared to 26% um, in the uh, NLST trial. Those who required invasive procedures such as lung biopsy or surgery was only 3.3%. Encouragingly, 96% of lung cancer diagnosed in talent trial were in stage 0 to stage 1. Prevalence of lung cancer with or without family history is 3.3% versus 2%. Interestingly, 19% of patients had multiple primary lung cancers. Just to illustrate the uh, uh, importance of family history of lung cancer and the risk of developing lung cancer in healthy individuals. On the right-hand side, uh, orange uh, bars, risk of invasive lung cancer increases from 1.6% in those with no family history to 6.2% in those with three or more family members with lung cancers. Talent trial was uh, a longitudinal trial with uh, follow-up over uh, multiple years. At baseline, the lung cancer detection rate was 2.6%, but over the subsequent few years, it drops to uh, less than 1%. Uh, in the uh, second screen, it was 0.5%. In the third screen, it was 0.4%. This tells us that there may be a way we can refine the interval of uh, CT scan so that there will be better uh, compliance and participations and better utilization of resources. How does the result from talent trial in a population who, who never smoke compare to uh, other trials uh, focusing on heavy smoking population? If you can look at the uh, far left column, uh, talent trial with family history, uh, never smoker, look at the uh, red figures, Baseline detection of lung cancer was 3.2% versus 1.1% in low NLSD trial. The positive predictive value was 16.6%, which was a lot better than 3.8% in the NLSD trial. And the rate of detection of uh, stage 0 to 1 uh, lung cancer uh, in a very early stage was 96% versus 55%. So these are very encouraging results. In Taiwan, after they have finished uh, talent trial recruitment, they have rolled out nationwide uh, lung cancer initiative focusing on uh, not just smokers, but also in non-smokers with family history. This is their uh, data of lung cancer uh, based on uh, early stage versus late stage uh, over the past 15 years. If you look at the light green bar on left-hand side, 2005, 11% of patients 
11% of healthy women, uh, 11% of women were diagnosed at early stage versus in 2020, uh, recent years, 45% of women were diagnosed at early stage. We hope that this will translate to reduction in lung cancer mortality. Uh, just the last part of my talk, how do we refine the tool of low dose CT scan? We all know that uh, it's possible to encounter non-specific ground glass changes on low dose CT scan. Looking forward, there may be two methods. One is artificial intelligence, and second one is the addition of blood-based analysis, looking at things like microRNA. Blood-based analysis uh, that's used in current practice is largely based on ctDNA looking, at, looking for uh, specific mutations in circulating tumor DNA. The most common one is EGFR. But EGFR is not a tool that we can screen for um, in terms of lung cancer detection as not all patients carry EGFR mutations. Multiple companies around the world have developed proprietary uh, algorithms looking at uh, specific data in microRNAs and methylation that may help uh, detect who is at risk of lung cancer. One of these kit is called the GRAIL kit. Um, at present, the data is not um, uh, uh, ready for widespread implementation as we can see that lung cancer detection rate is about 40% in this trial. Another way to move forward is to incorporate AI into low-dose CT scan. A group at Massachusetts General Hospital have collected data from 15,000 participants in the NLST trial, looking at more than 44,000 low-dose CT examinations. From this, they have developed an open code where it can be used without image annotation or clinical data from patients. This code will give a rough estimation of lung cancer risk over the next six years. One example of how this may help is uh, in this case. Uh, on the left-hand side, it is a baseline uh, LDCT image, which is not that remarkable in a 69-year-old with 99 pack year history of smoking. However, the AI tool placed 75 risk of lung cancer at six years in this particular patient in an area highlighted with a red color. The red color is not a PET scan, it's just an area highlighted by this artificial intelligence tool. The following year, the same patient had another low-dose CT scan and an abnormal patch showed up in the previously highlighted area. Patient went on to have a surgery, which confirmed a T1C n not squamous cell carcinoma. This kind of tool may help us refine lung cancer screening along the uh, uh, way we do for HPV screening. Those with high risk changes uh, or high risk uh, probability of developing lung cancer may need to have follow-up scan at a much shorter interval as six months, whereas those put at low risk of developing lung cancer may well wait for up to three to four years before their next scan. I'll just end with um, lung cancer screening in Asia expert consensus published recently in JTO. They recommend screening along the NL NLST uh, risk criteria in patients with uh, smoking history, but the smoking history uh, exposure has been dropped to 20 pack years. In addition to that, there's also recommendation of screening non-smokers aged between 50 to 75 with family history of lung cancer among first degree relatives. The frequency of screening is once every year, but should not exceed one, once every two years, and screening should be discontinued when they are more than 80 years of age. In conclusion, lung cancer screening using LDCT in smokers are backed by multiple randomized trials, mainly done in Western countries. In Asia, lung cancer has a unique epidemiology, and lung cancer screen in Asia in healthy individuals who never smoke with risk factors such as family history may well be feasible based on talent study from Taiwan. Further randomized trials on lung cancer screening in Asian populations should be performed to confirm the benefit of lung cancer detection in the early stage will translate to reduction in lung cancer mortality. In Singapore, we have the SOSTIS trial 
perform in uh, Singapore General Hospital. Moving forward, novel strategies such as imaging using artificial intelligence and novel blood-based biomarkers are being developed to allow more personalized screening strategy in future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wong, and thank you for staying with us. We have now come to the, the last speaker of today. And please welcome Dr. Lingaraj Krishna, an orthopedic surgeon, presenting on the subject of medial meniscus posterior root tears, a silent epidemic. So over to you, Dr. Lingaraj, please. Good afternoon. Um, it's an honour and privilege to be here today. And I must thank the organising committee uh, for inviting me uh, to this be uh, today's meeting. Um, today, I'm going to talk about medial meniscus posterior root tears, uh, which I think are important because they're common and they can lead to catastrophic consequences for the knee. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Lingaraj. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at Glen Eagles, uh, and my main subspecialty focus is knee surgery, both joint preservation as well as joint replacement. I have no disclosures uh, to declare for this talk. Now, the importance of the medial meniscus was first highlighted back in 1948 by T.J. Fairbank when he published a landmark paper called Knee Joint Changes After Meniscectomy. In that paper, he described the radiological changes that occurred following a meniscectomy. These included rich formation, narrowing of the joint space, and flattening of the femoral condyle. He therefore concluded that a meniscectomy is not an innocuous procedure. And he felt that the changes in the knee joint were due to the loss of the weight-bearing function of the meniscus. Now, he very eloquently described the weight-bearing function as being provided by a force which prevents the meniscus from slipping away like an orange pip between the fingers. In a series of very uh, elegantly done radiological studies, he described how with weight-bearing, the circumference of the meniscus is forced centrifugally. Now, if two ends of the meniscus are firmly attached to the bone, that force is resisted by the rising tension in the stretched and elastic fibrocartilage. Now, the greater the compression, the greater the circumferential tension in the meniscus, thus enabling the meniscus to share in weight bearing. Now, fast forward 80 years, and we now know that the medial meniscus is intimately involved in load transmission. It helps to convert compressive forces into hoop stresses. It increases tibiofemoral contact area and reduces contact pressures and 50 to 70% of the total weight is transmitted through the medial compartment by the medial meniscus. And this dissipation of axial load is essential for the viability of articular cartilage. In addition to that, we also know that the medial meniscus is very important for stability. It resists anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur, and the posterior horn is an important secondary stabilizer in the setting of ACL deficiency. So what then are medial meniscus posterior root tears? Well, they may be defined as either an avulsion of the posterior root attachment of the medial meniscus or a complete radial tear, tear that is located within one centimeter of the posterior meniscus insertion. Now, if you look at the image on the right, uh, we usually classify these tears into five types. Type one is a partial tear. Type two is a complete radial tear. Type 3 is a complete tear with an associated bucket handle component. Type 4 is an oblique tear that extends into the root. And type 5 is a bony avulsion of the root. Now, what are the biomechanical consequences of a medial meniscus posterior root tear? Well, firstly, contact pressures increase by 25%. And if you look at the image or the figure on the left, you will see that the effects of a medial meniscus posterior root tear are similar to those of a total meniscectomy. Now, these authors continued uh, to carry out a biomechanical study on the effects of a root repair and found that when you do so, this res restores peak contact pressures to that of an intact medial meniscus, as can be seen in the graft on the left. Now, how do medial meniscus posterior root tears come about? What is the pathogenesis? So in this study, uh, the authors looked at serial MRI scans of 27 knees in 26 patients. And they found that in every one of these patients, the medial meniscotibial ligament disrupted and medial meniscal extrusion occurred before the development of medial meniscus posterior root tears, as you can see in the MRI images uh, below. Now, the medial meniscotibial ligament is the ligament that generally holds the men meniscus to the medial tibial condyle and prevents it from moving out of position. Therefore, they concluded 
that the medial meniscotibial ligament disruption and medial meniscus extrusion were pathogenetic events leading to medial meniscus posterior root tears. And they could explain why meniscal extrusion is often not corrected by a root repair alone. So what then are the pathological consequences of these tears? Essentially, it is worsening osteoarthritis of the knee. The authors in this study looked at two groups of patients who had follow-up MRI scans done either within 12 months, uh, in which case they formed the subacute group, or beyond 12 months, in which case they formed the chronic group. And in both of these groups, meniscal extrusion and the severity of osteoarthritis in the knee worsened between the initial and final MRI scans. What about the epidemiology? Well, some have described the, the phenomenon of medial meniscus root tears as being that a silent epidemic. In terms of its incidence, it is now found to be more common than we previously thought and it accounts for 10 to 20% of all meniscal tears undergoing meniscal surgery. And the risk factors for these tears include varus alignment, a BMI of more than 30, and female gender. What about the clinical presentation? Well, patients often present with sudden posterior knee pain, especially after deep flexion or squatting. They may also complain of a popping sound that's heard while participating in light activities like ascending the stairs or squatting. They are less likely to have mechanical symptoms such as locking, catching, or giving way. On the physical examination, medial joint line tenderness is the most important sign to be elicited, and some authors have described an extrusion test. In this test, a various stress test is applied to the knee in full extension, and while palpating the anteromedial joint line, meniscal extrusion may be palpated and this extrusion disappears when that stress is removed. In terms of investigations, the gold standard is the MRI scan. It is shown, it has been shown to have a very high uh, sensitivity as well as specificity, and there are three diagnostic criteria. Number one, there should be medial meniscal extrusion of three millimeters or greater, as shown in the image on the left. There is a high signal indicating a disruption of the posterior meniscal root region on the axial view, as shown in the image in the middle. And thirdly, the presence of a ghost sign. This refers to the absence of an identifiable meniscus in the sagittal plane or increase in intensity, replacing the normal meniscus at the posterior root attachment. And this is shown in the image on the right. Other investigations include weight bearing, AP, Rosenberg, and full length radiographs of the knee and the lower limb. So this slide summarizes the diagnostic approach. First is the identification and recognition of risk factors such as various alignment and a raised BMI. The identification of specific symptoms such as sudden onset posterior knee pain as well as a popping sensation. The eliciting of specific signs in the physical examination such as joint line tenderness on the medial side as well as a positive extrusion test. And finally, confirmation with an MRI scan. Now, the management of these tears consists of three options. Number one, non-operative treatment. Number two, partial meniscectomy. And number three, a meniscus root repair. And the principal considerations are, one, whether the patient is a surgical candidate. Number two, whether this is an acute or chronic tear. And three, whether the patient has any significant pre-existing arthritis in the knee. So let's start with non-operative treatment. Now the indications for this would be patients who have multiple comorbidities which prevent surgical intervention and particularly if they have advanced degenerative changes in the knee. And the modalities for non-operative treatment would include the use of anti-inflammatory medication, both topical and oral, activity modification, the use of an unloaded brace, as well as intraarticular injections of steroids. Now, a partial meniscectomy was historically performed for these tears. However, it is much less so performed these days, and the current indications include patients who have chronic root tears and very severe pre-existing arthritis in the knee who fail non-operative treatment. They also include patients with partial root tears who, in whom a substantial portion of the footprint is still intact. It therefore goes without saying that care should be taken to avoid debriding the entire footprint so that the partial tear is not complete, converted to a complete tear. The advantages of a partial meniscectomy over a repair include decreased operative time, less stringent post-operative rehab protocols, and a faster return to activities and sport. So what about a meniscus root repair, which would be the mainstay of treatment? Well, the indications include acute traumatic root tears in patients who have merely normal or normal cartilage, as well as those who have chronic symptomatic root tears without significant 
pre-existing osteoarthritis in the knee. Now, there are two main techniques. The first is a transosseous repair, which is much more commonly done, and the second is a suture anchor repair. As its name implies, the transosseous repair in involves the use of passing sutures through the meniscal root tear edge through one or two transosseous tunnels in the proximal tibia with fixation on the anteromedial tibia with either a surgical button, a bone bridge, or an anchor. Uh, some surgeons use a suture anchor repair, and this potentially can avoid the need for bone tunnels that could in interfere with the ligament reconstruction if that is required. Now, it's important to talk about meniscal extrusion because we know from other studies that meniscus root repair alone does not completely correct meniscus extrusion or diminish the progression of osteoarthritis in all cases. In fact, in this study, MRI examination showed that the meniscus extrusion was reduced in only slightly more than half of patients. And in another study, patients with increased meniscal extrusion were found to have less favorable clinical scores and more radiographic progression of osteoarthritis compared to those who had less extrusion at a five-year follow-up period. As a result, various authors have come up with arthroscopic techniques to prevent extrusion by centralizing the body of the meniscus to the tibial plateau. And the image on the lower right shows how this is done. Now, in terms of rehabilitation, there are no consensus guidelines for post-operative rehabilitation after a root repair. However, because of the potential for suture displacement with cyclic loading, a slower and more careful rehabilitation program is required to avoid early failure. And most published protocols include restricted weight bearing for up to six weeks, restriction of flexion to 90 degrees for about six weeks, and restriction of loading beyond 90 degrees, as well as high impact activities for up to four to six months. So what about clinical outcomes? Well, we'll start with non-operative treatment. We know from this study that generally the results are poor. In this cohort of patients, nearly a third of patients needed a total knee replacement. Most of them had worsening osteoarthritis, and 87% of them reported that the non-operative treatment had failed. In terms of comparing a meniscectomy versus repair, in this study of 57 patients, the patients who underwent a repair were found of better post-operative outcome scores less radiographic progression of the osteoarthritis, less medial joint space narrowing, and a lower risk of conversion to a total knee replacement. In this meta-analysis that was done uh, of patients over a 10-year period, it was found that the meniscus repair led to the lowest rates of osteoarthritis, the lowest rates of total knee replacement, and also the lowest costs overall. Now, because meniscal centralization is a relatively new technique, uh, only short-term results are available, but from what we can see, this technique results in improvement of patient-reported outcome scores, as well as reduced meniscal extrusion after surgery. Now, what about patients who have root repairs but have varus deformity? In this paper, it was found that patients who had moderate varus deformity, and this would be patients who have 5 to 10 degrees of mechanical varus in the knee, did just as well as patients who had mild or normal alignment in the knee. There was no difference in the post-operative patient-reported outcome scores, as well as post-operative medial meniscus extrusion or osteoarthritis progression. Therefore, my take-home message is this. Medial meniscus posterior root tears are common. Early recognition and diagnosis are critical. Medial meniscus posterior root tears in patients who have significant comorbidities should be managed non-operatively. Active patients, regardless of age, should be considered for meniscus root repair. And this would include patients who have acute traumatic tears with nearly normal or normal cartilage, as well as those who have chronic symptomatic tears without significant pre-existing osteoarthritis. A transosseous meniscal root repair leads to good clinical outcomes. It decreases the progression of osteoarthritis and it decreases the need for a total knee replacement. Concomitant meniscal centralization can reduce postoperative meniscal extrusion, which we know is associated with poorer clinical outcomes. With that, I thank you for your kind attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions later uh, if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lingaraj, for your sharing. All right, now it's time for us to have a panel discussion, and we have the honor to invite back all our speakers that we are already right here so if you have any questions for the panel discussion please 
key them in in the Q&A section of this Zoom, which is just below. Click in and type in your questions and we'll try our best to answer all of the questions. All right, and you may also make an appointment with specialists at Glenagos Hospital for referrals for your patients to see our specialists right here within one day. You may refer to the number right there, the hotline and a WhatsApp number for you to refer to. Just message in to the WhatsApp number and the hotline right here on the screen for you to arrange just uh, in within one day to see the specialist in Glenagos Hospital. All right, hope you managed to screenshot and keep the numbers with you. Okay, so our panelists then, doctors, they're all ready. So let us welcome back Dr. Christopher Chong, Dr. Wong Siu Wei and Dr. Lingaraj Krishna on screen for this panel discussion. So at the same time, we're going to have Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong Siu Wei will be the moderator, all right? He's the medical oncologist at Parkway Cancer Centre who will be moderating. So right now, without further ado, let's hand over the time to the gentleman. Thank you all in the audience for staying back this afternoon. This is the last segment of our uh, symposium for this Saturday afternoon. Um, we, we are welcoming any questions that uh, come after our short talk. Um, with me, uh, the, the other two speakers, we'll start with the um, first question, um, which I'll direct to Dr. Christopher Chong. Uh, when is it appropriate to consider surgical interventions for urinary incontinence? Uh, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, most important, the first thing we must know that any leakage of urine is not normal. So urine leakage can be divided into mild, moderate or severe. When it's mild, you can do pelvic floor exercise. And if you do it for three months, and after three months you don't leak urine, you can continue doing pelvic floor exercise. And if after three months of good pelvic floor exercise and you still leak urine, we offer surgery. Now, 50% of people with urinary leakage has got uterine prolapse or womb prolapse or bladder prolapse. 50% of people with prolapse have urinary leakage. So if a person has mild urinary, urinary leakage and also have prolapse, whether it's mild, moderate or severe, we can offer surgery. So if it's mild, do pelvic floor exercise. If it's mild plus prolapse, we offer surgery. If urinary leakage is moderate or severe, we offer surgery because uh, pelvic floor exercise is unlikely to work to cure it. Chris, I'm just going to supplement that from, from my angle, sometimes we do have patients who have uh, previous treatment in the pelvis, such as radiation for rectal cancer. Uh, will that impact on your surgical options? So if... Um, Radiation causes the area that we operate to be very, very uh, scarred and very difficult to dissect. So that will be very challenging. And if it's very scarred, the old method of uh, using the birch corpus suspension where you open, do open surgery and put stitches under the bladder to pull it up, because it's scarred, you cannot be pulled. And I think the best option would still be to do a sling surgery, filling which probably the uh, bulking agent will be a good option. Um. How about, um, in the earlier session, we talked about obesity. Um, have you come across uh, major weight loss that may improve uh, the symptoms? Certainly, any trigger that uh, causes uh, urinary incontinence, stress, urinary, urinary incontinence, if you take that away, your chances of improving or get, getting better or even recovery is better, which include obesity as one, because the huge tummy putting pressure onto the pelvic floor, if you remove that, over a long period of time, that will help. Two, if you, you are always constipated, you solve the constipation problem, you don't have to push every day. Or when you are a chronic uh, cougher, you know, chronic smoker, always having chronic cough, keep pushing. So anything that trigger pressure onto the pelvic floor, especially without do, doing the pelvic floor exercise, then if you take that away, your chances of improving, even without surgery, will be much better. However, if you reach moderate to severe level, no matter what you take away, eventually you'll need surgery. Good, thank you. We'll move on to the next question uh, directed, directed to Dr. Lingaraj. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about potential complications of long-term, uh, sorry, potential complications or long-term effects of untreated medial meniscus injury. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you once again uh, for, for listening in. Um, Medial meniscus injuries uh, uh, come in different types and forms. Um, 
So in the form that I described earlier, which involves the root of the meniscus, where the medial meniscus is actually attached to the bone, these uh, tears in that area in particular are associated with the worst uh, risk of long-term outcomes. So as I showed earlier, um, the tear at the root of the medial meniscus posterior horn leads to a dysfunction of that meniscus and therefore leads to rapid deterioration progression of osteoarthritis in the knee. Um, and therefore, these particular types of tears should be treated early uh, and in many patients should be treated surgically. There are, of course, other types of medial meniscus tears which are less uh, serious. For example, you may have tears which are in the posterior horn, which are horizontal in nature. These are very common, but most of the time, these tears can actually be treated without surgery, and most patients actually improve uh, with uh, uh, non-surgical treatment. So in other words, we may encounter irreversible osteoarthritis if, you have, if you're leaving this condition untreated for many years. Correct. So, so these uh, medial medial meniscus tears in particular, they need to be assessed clinically as well as through an MRI scan. And with the MRI scan, one can identify where exactly the tears uh, are located. When the tear is located at the root, uh, where it is close to where it is attached to bone, these are the ones that we need to pay extra attention to. Because when the tear is in that location, the function of the meniscus is compromised. And when that happens, then the, car, the, the knee is at risk of uh, worsening osteoarthritis and worsening uh, articular cartilage degeneration. Okay, to a non-autopod like me, yes. so if you delay it further, you change your surgery from a repair to a knee total knee replacement. Exactly, okay. that's right. <laughs> so, medial meniscus tear is a bit from different from uh, the lateral, and, right? Correct. So, right. I, I had medial meniscus tear from uh, being banged by someone from skiing, mm. uh, and uh, I was a chicken. So, I decided not to do surgery. So, I rested for one full year without exercise. Mm -hmm. What the future will mean to me by doing what I did. Sure. So um, what you describe is what we call a traumatic mm -hmm. uh, meniscal tear or meniscal injury. So meniscus injuries can be either traumatic or mm -hmm. they can be degenerative, meaning that there is wear and tear or weakening of the meniscus and it tears as a result. So I think the first thing we need to do, Chris, is we need to get an MRI scan for you. Happy to see you in my clinic on Monday. Um, <laughs> But based on that MRI scan, I can then see where that tear is located. Right. I can see what, how much of the meniscus is involved. Um, has it healed over, over time? Mm. Uh, and, and based on the information that I get, I can then tell you. So if, for example, you have no symptoms right now, uh, and the MRI scan confirms that the meniscus uh, is still relatively intact, then I would say the, the prognosis for you is great. I mean, you know, you should have a good outcome, right? Um, but let's say, for example, if you tell me, oh, I have pain in my knee, uh, and, the, and the MRI scan shows that, oh, a part or a chunk of the meniscus is missing, then unfortunately, you are at risk of getting uh, worsening osteoarthritis in the future. Yeah, thank you. Okay, staying with Dr. Lingaraj, um, a question came in for the types of activities that are more likely to cause medial meniscal tear, uh, and is age or obesity risk factors for medial meniscal tear? Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent question. Um, Although there's no uh, definite data in the literature, uh, anecdotally, I can say that uh, one of the most common activities that my patients uh, perform uh, before they get these particular types of tears are activities that in involve squatting. And that's because when one squats, there's a lot of, there's deep flexion in the knee. And in that position, there is a lot of pressure on the meniscus, especially at the posterior horn or the back of the meniscus. Uh, and very often, patients complain that as they get up, they feel a snap or a pop in the knee. Uh, and that often heralds the start of symptoms. Uh, and that event usually is the event at which the tear uh, occurs or worsens. Um, in terms of uh, risk factors, um, well, age, yes, as we get older, uh, we are at higher risk of getting tears such as this. Um, in terms of the, this particular type of root tears, we have found um, that a BMI of more than 30, once again, we're talking about a BMI, is a follow-on from our earlier uh, session. Uh, that's been shown to be a risk factor for these tears. Uh, female gender, women in particular, uh, are known to be at higher risk of these tears. And finally, patients or individuals who have slightly bowed knees uh, are also at risk of getting tears uh, such as this. Cool. 
Okay, a question for myself. Uh, emerging biomarkers or technologies that could enhance lung cancer detection. Um, I touched on this at the end of my talk. Um, right now, um, the most robust uh, way of uh, screening for lung cancer is low-dose CT scan, which has a quarter of the radiation that's involved compared to a conventional CT scan of the chest. But with any CT scan, we, we are bound to see um, shadows that may not be lung cancer, especially in the era of COVID infection. So we touch on two technologies. One is uh, artificial intelligence uh, built into the reading of the uh, CT scan uh, images, independent of reporting radiologists. Um, those technologies uh, were likely to come into practice going forward, but obviously needs to be validated in uh, appropriate trials. What's more interesting is using blood-based technology to detect not just lung cancer, but using one blood test to screen for um, as many cancers as possible, up to 10 to 15 cancers. Um, and this is particularly attractive mm. because there are certain cancers that we can't screen for um, at present, such as pancreas cancer, uh, stomach cancer. Uh, we, we may do it in, in the high-risk population, but pancreas is, and hepatobiliary are the tough ones. Uh, with any blood-based technology, the challenge is how to make the performance of the test uh, useful for day-to-day -day use because we are bound to see noise signal uh, in, the, in the form of um, aging of our DNA. In, in our aging population uh, beyond 75, 80, we're going to see uh, what we call clonal hematopoiesis, normal wear and tear. Mm -hmm. This needs to be separated out from abnormal DNA and technologies are evolving to overcome this. So these are space to watch out for and uh, hopefully we, we can incorporate that together with Lotus CT Scan to make interpretation of a CT Scan even more meaningful. We'll move to Dr. Chong again. Uh, stress urinary incontinence, is it mainly a female problem or does it affect elderly male? And what can he do for men? Yeah. I'm a urogynecologist, so I look after females. <laughs> <laughs> but stress urinary incontinence is almost always a female problem because the door of the bladder cannot close properly because of uh, previous, say, childbirth or damage. For the men, it's a different thing. You have a prostate problem. Prostate will enlarge in all men, especially from 50 years onwards. How much you enlarge, to what extent you cause obstruction depends on the individual. So eventually, if a man leaks urine, it's due to overflow incontinence. They have so much urine that cannot be produced that it leaks out. So stress, urinary incontinence, coughing, running, jumping, seizing, causing leakage of urine is almost always a female problem. It is a very, very common problem, yet it's often ignored. Many of you, especially the female um, general practitioner, for example, or even gynecologist, when you do a pap smear, do you ask your patient, to push, to cough, to sneeze, to see whether there's a prolapse or there's leakage of urine? Hardly ever. So what the mind does not think, the eye will not see and the hands will not do. So we have to constantly remind ourselves to look out for such problem because it's such a big problem and especially in the primary, primary level, the general practitioners, you probably see more patients than us and many of them may have this leakage problem but they won't tell you unless you ask them. And then if they do that, then you can help them a lot because the surgery is so simple, so short, so painless, with high success rate, low complication. So there's a lot we can do to um, educate our population and help them. Okay, we'll move on to Dr. Lingaraj again. Um, short question, the expected uh, recovery time for a medial meniscus uh, repair surgery. Um, okay, so for medial meniscus posterior root tears in particular, um, the rehabilitation process can be a little slow at the beginning because one needs to give the knee uh, time to heal uh, the repair. So um, usually when we talk about return to sports, uh, particularly like tennis and badminton, I would usually tell patients that it will take about six to nine months from the time of surgery before they're able to do such high impact uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why is it that our sportsmen, professional footballers, they recover so much faster than what we will tell our patients to do? Or the time period that we tell our patients? Okay. 
Um, I think, first of all, um, it depends on the type of injury they have. Um, for example, if a soccer player or a professional soccer player has an ACL injury, um, the time of recovery would still be nine months. You know, most studies would suggest that they would need a minimum of nine months. Mm -hmm. But one reason why they may be able to recover faster is because they have much better uh, muscle control, more motivation in terms of uh, pursuing their rehabilitation uh, guidelines and exercise. Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy yeah. and so on. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll just do one last question. Um, so, for Dr. Lingaraj again, for those who have partial knee replacement for medial meniscal tear, how long will it be before the patient needs to do full knee replacement? Or can other options be considered? Okay. Um, first of all, a partial knee replacement uh, is done when one has um, severe osteoarthritis involving one compartment of the knee. Um, and in many patients, uh, it can last um, for 10 years or longer. Um, and a lot of it really depends on how that patient recovers and is monitored in the post-operative period. Yeah. Okay, we'll come up to our time here. Thank you for all your contributions and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, Dr. Chong, and Dr. Lingaraj for all your sharing. And also a big thank you to all our speakers, moderators, and doctors for all of your insightful sharing. And also not forgetting to thank you for staying with us all the way to now. Indeed, we have now come to the end of the Glen Eagles Hospital's 25th Annual Medical Seminar. So uh, this year, as once again, we emphasize on the theme wellness across generations, navigating obesity and active aging. So we do value your feedback right now. Would you please scan this QR code on the screen? Uh, we promise it's going to take you very, very short while for some simple questions to give us some feedback on today's event. Please, thank you so much. And also, if you'd like to rewatch today's seminar, this session the recording will be available online after today which will be at www.gleneagles-seminar.com. So it will be available all the way to 30th of November this year, 2023. With that, we look forward to see you again on our next seminar. I'm Paige signing off right here, wishing you a great weekend. Take care. See you again. Goodbye. <laughs>